I heard you say your experience as a radar technician really prepared you for success as an entrepreneur. Please explain why. Yeah, so when I became like a radar technician in the military, it just gave me a sense of independence, right? Because it's one of the only jobs in the military where you're actually on your own. Like there's no, there's no like chain of command. There's like 180 of us in the entire army. So, you know, when you go somewhere, you're usually by yourself or with one other person. And, you know, because of that independence, because of that making your own schedule and doing your inventory and everything else, it really teaches you a way to basically be able to manage any kind of business scenario, right? I feel like those intangible skills that I got in the military really translated well into eventually owning my own company and hiring a lot of people, you know? So. What were some of the skills you received while in that position? Oh, yeah, so um, some of the things that I was taught specifically would be like, um, organizing your inventory, making sure that that's properly done. Um, or, you know, so a lot of outsourcing and stuff that we're doing nowadays in order to get our books. That was something that I learned back in the military. Also, uh, you know, how to properly schedule people. It was mostly management skills, right? My radar skills didn't really help, <laughs> help at all on the outside, right? Because you have to get that kind of job. But, you know, the ability to, you know, manage people, set your schedules, um, get them to a proper, uh, you know, to basically look after themselves, right? That standard of quality. Because that's one of the biggest things about being a radar tech. Is like, if something goes wrong, right? The whole airfield shut down, right? So you got to make sure the standards are kept across the entire board. Otherwise, you know, you could be causing weeks of problems for something that you could have easily checked, you know, just through quality control. So that's just something that I felt was super important. Uh, it's literally like the, the bedwork to being an entrepreneur in general. You've got to be able to handle that. And how did you even get that position? In the military? I just take a test, you know, uh, uh, the ASVAB. And it was pretty cool. You know, at the end of the day, you, you have to study in order to get the right scores and everything else, kind of like an SAT, right? But if you um, get high enough, you get to pick your job, right? And that was one of the jobs that I, got to, that I picked. I originally wanted to be an air traffic controller. So, you know, that's, there were no slots for air traffic control, so I did the next best thing. I became a radar tech. The military is about 40% minority, right? It's pretty high. Pretty high, It's right? pretty high, yeah. Um, and there are stigmas in society in regards to military people transitioning. What was your experience? Did you, you never got deployed, right? No, I wasn't. All right, good. So you weren't deployed. What was your transition like from going to the military to becoming a civilian? Yeah, so um, I initially tried to find work in my field, right? That didn't really pan out. Uh, so, but I did become a, uh, a telecommunications engineer. So I went out there and I was learning how to basically uh, uh, do the maps for like UVerse and, and, and Fios and all that stuff, right, for the cities. And then eventually the entire field got outsourced <laughs> to India or something like that. So, uh, you know, I went, to, I went to college instead because, you know, I had the GI Bill and everything else. That was a great thing about it, right? I had a GI Bill that was holding me over. Uh, I met my wife in 2009. You know, she, she was also in the military as well, so she just got out. Uh, and, you know, our transition was, was while I couldn't find the work that I was supposed to do in my field, right? At the end of the day, I had a heck of a lot of help through, like, government programs and stuff to get me going on my way you know please explain the components of a perfect pitch when trying to persuade someone to become an investor in your company <laughs> well you know the pitch actually matters on who you're actually pitching to right so so i always say that's the context of it right if you look if you're looking to an, a customer to invest in you right literally put cap uh, money into you for capital right then the main things is what is the uh, what is the goal of your company, and I don't mean goal as in like like I want to make money or something like that. That's not going to motivate somebody who's supporting on the ground level. What you want to do is basically give them the mission statement. What is your mission? What is what is the purpose of you doing this? For for me, I'm making content for um, African American youth, right, so that they can eventually see their legacies and history, the stuff that nobody else wants them to see. Right. And then hopefully next time they'll be way better off than what we were when we were when we were growing up. That's my mission statement. So people can support that regardless if they like comic books or not. Right. Because I make comic books. So it's like, so it's like you know, super niche. 
right? But proper, um, you know, the proper way to raise your child, that is not niche, right? That's something that every black parent wants their kids to know something about Africa, right? Something about what, what came before them so that they can, you know, grow up and have aspirations for greatness. I feel like people who don't have that automatically don't have like the proper aspirations for like their future if they think that what they came from was slaves and that was it. You know what I mean? And that's just the way I feel about it. Now, when you're talking to an investor, right? Somebody who bests all the time, it's a completely different pitch, right? That's when you're talking about your financial statements, your documents, you want to be as transparent as you possibly can on what you're doing, your long-term plans five years from now, you know, uh, uh, and also why you're unique in your, in your field. If you're just another version of something else, they're going to be like, why don't I just invest in that, right? So you got to be unique. When and how did you nurture the skill of storytelling? You know, honestly, I got that from video games. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, I'm one of the biggest video game fanatics there is. I probably do, I probably do at minimum 40 hours a week. I'm dead ass serious. It's not a joke. I play games all the time, right? I don't even know how I fit it in, right? Because I am always on games. But at the same time, you know, at the end of the day, I'm a creator, right? I write stories nonstop. So if I don't have constant inspiration, from, <laughs> right, that, that, you know, you get burnt out really quick. So, you know, I, it's something that's always been a passion for me. One day I'll go hardcore into games, right, making them myself. That's what I initially wanted to do with Black Sands, right? But for now, man, you know, I get heavy, heavy influence from video games. That's why I can make these, like, stories that have a lot of branching, or, or, you know, like storylines and different characters who are lovable. You know, it's the idea of that, you know, you need marketable pieces, right? You need people in the stories that people actually care about, right? Even the villains have to be likable, right? Or, or you know, something that you can actually like get behind. And, and uh, that's that's what really motivated me. I also do a lot of uh, research in general on like uh, you know historical stuff because I'm a history buff, big time history buff. And you know, I always look at ways others have failed in telling their stories. Right. And, and figure out how to, you know, clean up some holes, some loose ends that they might have had in their in their stories and make a more compelling version. You know, how do you create a duality and a character where you dislike them, but you also love them and have compassion for them? OK. Yeah. So um, I think that kind of goes with like the idea that they're relatable. Right. So you could dislike what somebody does, but at the same time, you know, feel like they're honorable, right? So, so, you know, the villain, right? The villain could, could, you know, clearly be trying to destroy, right? The entire nation of what's it called? But if they have some kind of like honor system or something like that, something that you can clearly see why they're doing it, or if they have a really good origin, let's say somebody really got, got screwed over in their, in their past, right? And you can relate to something like that. Do you really care if they if they're doing bad things today? If you could have kind of been like, you know, if I wasn't crazy, he said, if I was crazy, I probably would have did that too, right? You probably would have leaned that way as well. That's why a lot of people love Killmonger, right? It's a lot of people like Thanos, right? It's because it's the origin story of those characters, right? It's the it's, it's the background story of those characters that got them to the point where they are today. And now you don't feel too bad about why they're doing the things they're doing. You don't agree with it. You would never do it. But you don't hold it over them like, man, he's just evil, unde un uh, irredeemable people, you know? Give me an example of, of uh, someone telling their historical story or a history of their country, nation, whatever, where you feel they kind of dropped the ball. They could have did a better job. Uh, Take your time. <laughs> this one. This was hard, right? Because there's not much in this field, right? It's not much, especially in African history, right? So I would have to say, and I'm gonna go a little bit broader because you know white people know how to tell their history. <laughs> they they know they know how to make their histories amazing, right? Way better than it was. But um, I would say like there's a lot of films that were films, you know, stories, documentaries about native cultures and stuff like that. And I've never seen anything about, you know, the Inca, which is wild to me because they were easily the most advanced culture of all of the uh, of the of any native like like people, 
like they had hundreds of thousands of soldiers on a whim right they were metal workers they had all metal weapons and armor and it was the culture was crazy and they were and, they were, and we st and they still allow us to see uh people in loincloths and spears right loincloths and that bow and arrow and that's it and you're like these cats weren't like that man wish you would try to talk to an Inca that way you know and, and I feel like that was that was lost in the sauce like we still try to tell stories about you know a couple of Apaches or whatever but we're not really focusing on the biggest civilization there was right uh and how they really wrecked us for for a minute and I mean us as in like the west in general right Portuguese got their asses handed to them by 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 the Inca for a while and they had to get a whole bunch of other people who are rivals to them in order to even like oppose them at all because they, they were handling the, themselves pretty well so yeah that's one of the things I, I feel like that that was done um and there's some other ones as well but for the most part you know we don't really have the, the power of the purse so we can't tell our greatest story they only want to tell the stories that are at our lowest points and I feel like that's something that we can do ourselves you don't need a hundred million dollars to make a movie about Mansa Musa you need like five million maybe and you tell me you can't crowdfund that I will eventually <laughs> right when you tell me you can't crowdfund something like that of course you can I heard you say in a uh, interview African-American the African-American community does not understand what equity means in business Please explain what equity means. Yeah, this is a huge misconception. So a lot of people thought when I went on Shark Tank, right, that I had given away 30% of my profits for the rest of my life, <laughs> right? And that's not what equity is. People just don't understand that, you know, you know, it's not just black people, right? But in general, a lot of people who are not investors, right, or not in the space of like investing, they don't understand that equity is not profit sharing. Profit sharing is a completely different model. You know, it's basically like debt, right? So equity is straight up, if you exit one day or if you go IPO one day or go into like basically the public market, right? And that price becomes a public price and people can sell shares at any given point in time, right? That is when that 30% is gonna matter. That's when that huge amount of uh, equity they own in the company becomes real money. But prior to that, it's nothing that like, like if, if my business just ended up failing, equity holder has nothing. It's like, it's like, that's just the way it is. It sucks, right? It's a gamble on the future of your company. And for me, you know, when they say stuff like that, it's like, if I own 51% of the company, I have veto power. If I never elect directors to my company, I have veto power, right? I'm like, I'm not, like, you know, they're like, hey, I want to do directors. I'm like, no, I'm not doing any directors, right? I don't want anybody in control of any voting right in my company because I need complete control so people don't understand that and they, they kept thinking that I had given up ownership now they're going to dictate how I make stuff and everything else it's like I have veto power on every level right I still have plenty of equity in the future to sell if I need to do more rounds in the future right and now I have a huge Rolodex so you know you know for people who don't understand equity it's just a simple fact that it's ownership of the company from a economic standpoint, not a like uh, a power dynamic. You have no power at all until you're over 51%, period. You know, uh, and, and that could be a collective too. If a whole bunch of people together own 51%, right? They can overpower the 49%, right? If they all voted the same way. That don't happen in my company. <laughs> but but it, you know in other companies people have been kicked out that way through like a, a coalition growing underneath them when did you decide to create stories about the glory of african history instead of the trauma it seems like we're in a generation where everyone's selling trauma specifically when it comes to african culture me i was just sick and tired of it to be honest with you it's like the word on the street it was <laughs> <laughs> right the word on the street was they ain't want to watch no more 12 years of slave type movies and stuff like that in the first place it's just not it who are we teaching like who are we teaching these lessons to who is being educated with this content we know people got lynched right we know there's still racism in america i don't need to see a movie about that i don't need to see a reenactment of someone getting shot right and then the cop 
you know, getting off on a, on a trial. I don't need to see that. I see it in real life. I don't need to see that, you know. So, uh, you know, I decided that's going to be my rallying call. Let's see how many parents are going to be out there who are going to think the same exact way, right? And it turned out that, you know, I was making a good bet, you know, because at the end of the day, we still have 95% of the people who make black comic books are making stories about superheroes, right? Completely like fantasized versions of the world where it's like everybody has powers and stuff like that. And I'm like, I just want to talk about history, right? And if one day I do make it, my show comes out and everything else, I'm going to be like the de facto creator of African history in this median in general because nobody's really invested in it prior to this, like 50 years. So, you know, hopefully what I could do is I break open that gate, I make a big, beautiful wall where everybody has to go through, this, <laughs> through the Black Sands path, right? And I give people who have the proper merits, right, the ability to make their own stories, their shows or whatever. So I already have like, like 12 publishing deals already on the table uh, and four of them are on specific cultures in, in, in Africa. We have, you know, Mask of the Orisha, we have uh, Madagascar, Lions Game, and oh yeah, Carthage. That was one that was kind of like, it's kind of black good enough, it's black enough, right? Carthage and then uh, uh, Granada Shadow. So we got like five different cultures, right? All across Africa from different time periods, right? Because we want to have, we want to be known as that company. Now, I myself have a background in business. I, I, I myself have a background in business. I played Division One basketball. What I noticed in our community in regards to African Americans, um, people seem to have a, uh, a, they struggle with you growing into a different stage in your life. Mm -hmm. Have you experienced that in the community or in business in regards that you started to hear and now you're here and people don't accept that you're here, but they still want to treat you as if you're here? Mm. Okay. Well, one, I've, I've never really much in, involved family in my business in general. So that was something I kind of like, like separated early. I just knew that you, you couldn't rely on family to, to really have a business in general. Like you need a lot more customers than your family will ever be in the first place. And most of the time your, your, your family is supporting you because they're supporting you as a family member. Not because they need your product, not because they love it, not because they're giving a real opinion on it. Just they trying to support you, you know. It's kind of like, hey, I gave you one, whatever. I'm not going to use it all the time. I might never use it, right? So I felt that that was something that was there. But once I started transitioning to a successful entrepreneur, that's when I started having, you know, people like say, I, I, call, I call people haters all the time, right? But at the end of the day, right, if you got criticism of me, great. I don't care about that. But if your problem is that I made it, that's weird, right? <laughs> Like, like, and a lot of people out there who try to, they start making up stuff, you know, they start randomly saying, you know, all these things about me. Cause you know, I'm pretty popular on social media. So they go out there and they go try and make hit pieces on me and stuff about, oh, he's a scammer and stuff like that. I said, how am I a scammer? If I already gave everybody all their stuff, uh, I have <laughs> like, like you have stock in my company. What, what's the scam? <laughs> right. But they say that because the second you make it, all of a sudden you're Hollywood. All of a sudden you're Netflix. I'm like, I still don't have a show yet, you know. But you guys are coming at me like I freaking have a billion dollars. How come you ain't representing my segment of the black community? I said, I don't know. Maybe because someone else is. Why do I got to do it? You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, what I'm saying it's like, it's like, if somebody came up to me and said, you know, how come you ain't do a a, a story of you know of Jamaica's um, history? I'll be like, because I'm waiting for a Jamaican writer to bring me a story that's amazing, right, that I can fund. I got no problem doing it, but I'm not going to do it. I ain't got time. I got resources, right? I got, I got money, and I can put that money in the proper hands, right? But I can't do anything about that if nobody actually sends it to me. You know what I'm saying? At least I can't do everything. I'm still just a dude, right, of, of, a, of, a, of a company. So there's a lot of expectations that instantly come on you the second you even get on television once, right? And it's like, bro, I am not Tyler Perry yet. I can't, right? I ain't got Tyler Perry money, and I damn sure ain't got his responsibilities right now. So, you know, y'all gonna have to wait, you know? I don't know the exact number, but it has to be like 90 to 98%, 99% of comic book stores are owned by white men, right? Yep. All right. With that information, what's the name of that distribution company? Diamond Distribution? Mm-hmm. 
why did you even go to them with your comic book? I did. Yeah, I was saying, why did you even go to them knowing the clientele that they cater to and their relationship in the past with black publishers? Well, I, I honestly don't do any business with them at all. Uh, uh, but one of the things was, at one point, they actually stopped me from getting a deal. So, so at one point, I was being uh, considered for um, Lion Forge and Dark Horse. So both of them wanted, wanted Black Sand. I had sold a crap load of books early in my career. Right, and they were like, "This is really nice." I was at American Library Association, so they all saw me there with all the librarians, and they saw how they had a lot of interest. They were like, "This could be a really big thing for us." And then when they went back to their team to talk about, "Hey, let's see what this is like," you know, Diamond hit them with the, "It's going to be very hard to distribute." All right, he said, "We're going to have to educate the customer." And they're not talking about you or me or anybody who works in the, that that buys a comic book shop. This is not about the comic book shops, the owners of those. I feel like it's gonna be really hard to get them, you know, to buy some copies of, of this. I remember Diamond's a no return policy company, which sucks, right? Because Barnes and Noble's 100% returns. Your book don't sell, they send it back to you and you paying for it, right? So, so they have no problem buying your books and, get, and bringing them in because they know that if it don't sell, send it right back. Real quick, what's the time period do they uh, give uh, you in regards to selling to the books? How does that work in that business? Oh, it's typically like six months or something. So it's not a short period of time. It's like they give it a minute, you know, as long as they don't buy like a thousand copies, you know, <laughs> you know, they should be pretty good. But yeah, what Barnes Noble, 100 percent return policy on everything. But, you know, Diamond, no return policy at all. So what do they do? They buy exactly how many pre-orders they have. Right. If it's something that they think is going to hit their their audience, they might buy five copies. If it's something that there's no chance in hell they could they could think of somebody actually like buying it on a consistent basis, they might buy one. But think about it: if shops are buying one or none on a consistent basis across the board. This stuff's dead on arrival. Like you automatically fail, you know. So so this is the idea. That Diamonds like it's gonna be a really hard sell. So they told them no. Dark Horse is like, hey, we can't really get this at the market. So you could probably sell more copies than us. So no. And, you know, at that point, I was like, I'm going to have to distribute myself directly to audiences online, you know, and, and eventually now with PGW and they sell to Amazon, and they sell to, P, to Barnes and Noble and everything else. But we don't mess with comic book shops at all. I don't care at all what happens in comic book shops. And that's why I also don't pander to them either. So I don't get, none of my messaging is for comic book fans. All my messaging is for like black parents, educators, all that other stuff. I care less what comic book fans think about <laughs> my comics or anything like that because they're not part of my ecosystem at all you're doing extremely well with your online sales right i just wanted to ask um how did you find your target audience uh when executing your online marketing well personally it was like uh you know memes i'm gonna be honest with you it all started with memes nowadays memes don't rock that well but back in the day i used to do memes like crazy on facebook and instagram to get that initial base Facebook was popping back then, so it used to always, you know, you can get like a thousand shares, two thousand shares on a freaking post on on Facebook. Not anymore, but back in the day, you used to be able to do that all the time, right? Uh, Instagram was always about having some kind of like alliances. So a lot of creators who are similar to you, right? And they'll repost your stuff, you repost their stuff every now and then, right? And that reciprocity really built your initial base, right? And then straight up Facebook ads. Back when they were good, they're not good now. But back in the day, it was good. Facebook ads, I used to get like four or five X returns consistently forever, right, for years. So that's what really helped us grow, right? And, and you know, I'm telling you, man, it's like you got to understand. The main thing you got to understand is just simply who is your customer base, right? Surveys are amazing ways to figure that out, right? Uh, I always say, like, do some kind of crowdfunding or something at first just to figure out, just to have a really concentrated amount of customers and then survey them whoever was after the campaign survey them and figure out who the heck they are right who are the people who actually like put money into your pocket right because once you figure that out you'll know what to do like for instance you know 55 percent of my customers are parents you know and i'm talking about my investors so these are people who put like a thousand dollars in and stuff like that so i know right who to talk to right and I'm like very small percentage of them are people who read comics on a weekly basis. You know what I'm saying? 
So I understood that when I'm going into marketing, don't market it as the best comic book ever written in, in life. It's the best gift you could ever get for someone else. <laughs> because no, most of the people ain't read the, uh, the customers are not by, um, the readers, you know? So that's my idea. I'm also eventually about to start opening up uh, uh, kind of like a call center thing where people can call in and just get help with their orders directly. Because like I said, the, the customer is not the consumer. So just like in a toy store, most people buy a toy after they've talked to a staff member to say which toy is right for my son or your daughter. So that's how I feel like the experience of the online store will go way better if we have somebody basically holding their hand on what's right, what's not for the kids or whatever, right? And you know, I think that's gonna help us a lot with our conversion rates. Doing my research for your industry, it seems pretty much like the music industry in regards to uh, publishing, holding rights and everything, okay. right? Um, I heard you say in a uh, past interview that all success is not good success. Mm -hmm. uh, you were referring to artists, storytellers, writers who created something that generates billions of dollars, but they themselves haven't really profited that much from it. Yeah. Please explain, elaborate more in regards to all success is not success because people, especially when they're in the business, they're very quick to get paid instead of holding on to the rights to their product. So one thing I've, I've definitely seen is that Basically, people sometimes, they give up everything before they actually get to the next level, right? So they give up absolutely everything they own in order to get to the movie stage or whatever. Same thing for music, right? In order to get that first album, they've done a whole 360 deal. They lose everything, right? And they make like maybe $500,000, <laughs> right? After like three years. Meanwhile, the label made like freaking 30, 40 million dollars, stuff like that. Same thing in movies, man. If you go, if if you come with a script, most of the time they're gonna take everything from you. They're gonna take every right, everything on licensing, merchandising, video games, whatever. They're gonna take everything. So the reality is, if you can get to that stage without giving up your stuff, you've won. Because season two doesn't matter. Nobody cares. Season two, they're gonna pay just straight cash to be a part of that. They're not gonna try to take your rights away. You're established, right? Everything is about that first, that first season or that first movie that decides whether you're going to own anything at all, right? And, and that was super important for me to make sure that that would not happen to me. So I've been doing that. Uh, one of the people I know, Kishimoto, the person who created Naruto, right? Naruto has done $15 billion in sales globally. $15 billion, all right? He's worth $40 million. He's not even worth 1% you know, of, of his IP. The thing that he still to this very day draws every panel and writes the story for like 20 plus years. That's cold, man. And then you got people like George Lucas who held on to his rights, right? And they had to buy him out for $6 billion, right? <laughs> it's like, so, you know, they're just, it's just two different kinds of things. And it's not like, oh, that's because George Lucas is white because, you know, we're, we're looking at freaking, um, what's his name, Stan Lee. He was poor too, relatively to what Marvel was, right? So, so he didn't get that the Goldilocks deal. He gave up all his rights. They still trying to pay Sony for Spider-Man. They're like, man, I can't believe we gave up Spider-Man all the time. He said, yeah, you gave up your literal most valuable character. You gave that up to Sony and they're never giving him back. <laughs> You know, they're never giving it back no matter what happens. So this is the reality of things, man. You got you to gotta hold the line. Also, the other way as well is, you know, um, doing stuff for other people instead of what you, you want to do or what your original goal was. A lot of people turn, change their entire business model once they start making money. All of a sudden, they leave all the people that they used to know behind. They start going out there and... and, and, and no offense, but they start cooning and stuff, right? And they start being hardcore whitewashed and everything else, and they don't give a damn. And they start talking about, I make, I make stuff for everybody. Believe it or not, they don't even want you to make stuff for everybody. They didn't sign you. I, I, I'll give you a good example, too. Uh, Netflix has a whole bunch of black shows right now, black animes. They're on there, Yusuke and all the other stuff, right? So, you know, and LaShawn Thomas, he was making those, he was making those titles, right? Uh, uh, and they wanted him to make some dope black animes 
And he in his head was, I want to make shows for everybody. <laughs> I don't want this to be a black exper- exclusive experience. So the shows flopped, right? Because nobody watched them because nobody was really target market for it, right? And, and, and he's confused as to why. And it's the idea is that they brought you to the party. Black people brought you to the party. They kickstarted your stuff. They funded the heck out of you. They brought you to the dance, and then you totally left them on, on the court to go and dance with somebody else, right? And, and people do that all the time, man. They flip up. The second they get any kind of success, they abandon their base. They just totally abandon their base, and they go for this new market that they don't even know is real yet, right? They just go for it. Like, I'm just going to change up, right? Do what Tom Perry did. Tom Perry's a billionaire now because he didn't give up on his base. He tried other things that went once or twice, and then he was like, this is dumb. Why am I making movies like this? You know what? I'm going back to the movies that single moms, <laughs> and what's it called? They love this stuff. I'm going to make stuff for them only. And anybody else wants, I don't care what they want. I'm going to make the stuff that I know work, that my audience wants. And, you know, he might not have got all these awards and stuff like that, but he got more than everybody else because he stuck to his base. Stick to your base. What historical text books did you use in regards to putting the story together, and why did you focus on the time period that you decided to? Well, I didn't use historical text for this. So most of my references are online, uh, and I, I, I kind of look at the different, uh, like, mythological thesis that basically everybody agrees on, right? And then I take a cultural brush to it, right? So I say, if this was true, right? <laughs> and people just didn't know what the heck they were looking at. What would be the real story of Ra? What would be the real story of these characters? And furthermore, how all these cultures all existing at the same time, but nobody has the same, you know, story, right? So I started looking for ways that they intersect in some kind of ways so I can make a cohesive story in Black Sands, right? So you got Greeks, you got Minoans, you got the Kushites, you got all these different people in the story, Sumerians, right? How do you put them all in the same story which no one's really done, which is crazy. I don't even understand how that's possible. I mean, the Mediterranean Sea was not like a, you know, like they were always inter- like interacting with each other all the time, but nobody made a story where it was like more than one culture, right? So I was like, we gotta do this. I picked pre-dynastic, so I have liberties to make whatever the heck I want, right? <laughs> right? Cause I don't want nobody coming at me like, that's not what certain person did. I'm like, doesn't matter. It's all pre-dynastic. I can do whatever the hell I want, <laughs> right? And I just felt like by doing that and giving myself some liberties and then, you know, uh, allowing new ideas to come in, right? I think it would, it would be a great story to tell, right? And because I am hitting those key moments in the mythological story of Ra, of the mythological story of Asar, right? That it's close enough where it can be taken seriously, right? But I'm not going to let the actual story dictate whether it's going to be a dope you know, series or not. You know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, you know, Vikings is 100% super hardcore and accurate. Like, they got people literally coming in that were like 200 years after the timeline. <laughs> right? So it's, like, it's like, hey, but he's a cool character. I'm going to put him in there. So for me, you know, uh, it's, it's not necessarily about historical accuracy as it is about uh, amplifying the culture. Right, amplifying the culture, giving a great freaking legacy that people can live up to. Doesn't matter if it's 100% accurate or not. What matters is whether people are proud of another African civilization. That's the big. That's the big important part. And where did you find the artist or the graphics? Person? Oh yeah. So, believe it or not, I, I met David Letterman on a Facebook group. So I, I'm, I actually get a lot of artists in Facebook and you know stuff like that. Facebook's probably my best source. Facebook groups. And he wasn't even looking for jobs because he's like never looking for jobs, <laughs> right? He's really, really, really like highly sought person. But uh, he was bragging about something that he was doing, right? So he was, you know, he was in one of those groups where they like artists just bragging to each other, like, yeah, look what I did. Oh, look what I did. You know, that was pretty dope, man. Do you mind if you could do one for like Raw or whatever? He was like, oh, I like this character, you know, Frenchman. And he was like, <laughs> he was like, okay, I'll do it. And he made the original Raw. I had some very basic art at the time, you know, for my stuff. But when I saw his version of, of Raw, 
I said this could be, this could be a, a goddamn you know right? It's like, it's like, it's like this could be a billion dollar IP if I go and lock this dude down if I figure out a way to get long term this dude right and, and, and show sure enough man like this guy's me personally I think there's not that many people in the world that are like artists of their time right. And I feel like this guy, because he's not real known, because he lives in China, you know, he's, a, he's a Frenchman living in China, right? Uh, uh, it's, it's just, he's not like a, a person that would be in the spotlight, but he could do everything. 3D model sculpting, I mean, like literally learn that stuff in like two months, he learns how to do complete 3D model, perf, perf, perfect Thanos type stuff. He could do everything, whatever he like, like, like any skill you need that's involved in art, he can learn that stuff in like, like, like a couple of weeks and master it within months. And I'm like, I don't understand how I got lucky enough to lock him down, all right? But like I said, man, this guy's, you know, he's an art director for our company now and everything else. He keeps other people in check as well while still doing the main art for the Black Sand series, right? You know, and now I have a whole bunch of artists that are really good. Not nearly as good as him, but definitely good enough. So how does it work with the art like so it has that consistency when someone else is doing it? He shows them what to do or how does it work? Yes, yeah, so we have some standards in place. So so before it was just him, right? He did everything. And it took a while to get things done, like three, four days per page, right? Because he has to he has to pencil, ink, um, color, and then shadow and do all that stuff, right? And, and so it took about three or four days to do a page. Now, uh, he could do an entire chapter in a month, probably less, but he's doing the pencils. So he's drawing everything. The main thing is to have the penciler be the person who originally did the style. Like you don't want to have, you can mix up the colorists, right? Because as long as they do the right color correction and you can have the professionals go and touch things up at the end. Like he still touches up the comics afterwards. So once it's all submitted, he'll go into the PSD files and just brush up certain things or make certain lighting the right way or something like that, right? He'll do that. But for the most part, he's pretty hands off on everything else. Once he sends off the, the pencils of all the pages, it looks like a finished comic. Like if I just gave people the pencils of the entire issue, he does the, he does the um, lettering as well. So you can read the entire issue the second he's done, right? The next people come in, they do the inks, line it up. It's hard to mess up inks when you got really good pencils, right? So they're just cleaning it up. And then you got your colorist and your shader. My shader is really, really good. He's been working with us for a very long time. So he keeps the colorist in line. He used to do the coloring and the shading. Now he's just doing the shading, right? And that speed that we have now, you know, we can easily get an issue out every month, stuff like that when we want to. Well, it used to take like four to six months.